We often think of wars that are something that happens somewhere else to some other people. But in 1813, the front lines of a massive conflict were right here. Many of you have driven by this place, Fort Meigs in Perrysburg, many times without thinking about what happened here. Today, we're going to dive into the War of 1812 and how its results created precisely the conditions that led to the beginning of Toledo as a city. So it's kind of funny. We talk about World War II all the time, right? Especially me, because I'm a World War II nut. I talk about World War II all the time. We talk about the Civil War a lot. We talk about the Vietnam War quite a bit. Uh, and, and I think people are even starting in, in history classes to talk about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. None of those wars happened anywhere remotely near Toledo, Ohio. And yet the war that we talk about, I would argue just about the least in Toledo, Ohio, is the one that was fought right here. The War of 1812. So much of this military conflict is all about our region. Some of it's being fought right here, right towards Perrysburg, Maumee, uh, going up towards the edge of the lake, um, being fought out on the lake, just north of town in Monroe. It's, it's being fought around here, but it's also critical to our origin story. The War of 1812 is, is why Toledo ends up existing at the time and place it does. So, Let's talk about the War of 1812 and how it's kind of the end of an era and the beginning of a new one in the city of Toledo's history. So, in the War of 1812, we find that most Native American people are siding with the British in this one. Now, if you contrast that this to the last video, you remember that the Native nations basically aligned with the French against the British in the French and Indian Wars because many Native nations made the calculation the political calculation, the French are not as bad as the British, so we're going to team up with them. They are making precisely the same calculation now. The British are not as bad as the Americans, let's make a deal with them. So this native confederacy ends up fighting on the side of the British. And um, they're, during the period before the war, the natives are being supplied by the British, who see them as important allies. Now, the British aren't trying to launch a war on the American colonists, but the British are also trying to keep American colonists in their place. And part of doing this is secretly providing weapons and ammunition to these native nations in places around Toledo. Um, when the War of 1812 is declared, these native nations join the British side, as I said. And they do it, as I've put in bold, with the express goal of keeping the Maumee Valley. If you remember, after the Battle of Fallen Timbers, the Maumee Valley was what was reserved for especially many different peoples, but especially the Ottawa and the Miami. This was their last place, right? This was what we had promised them. This was the land they wanted to hold on to forever. And so when they join with the British, the whole deal is we're not doing this for Britain. We're doing this to hold on to this valley. This is our turf, our land, and we don't want outsiders coming onto it. Now, along the frontier, there are other people of non-Native American backgrounds who also have to make decisions um, between Britain and the United States. And some of these frontier people in places like Michigan and Northern Ohio are going to go over to the British side. Others are going to go to the American side. And one of the ones who comes to the American side is one of the most famous Toledoans of all time, old uh, Peter Navarre. So um, Peter Navarre and his brothers, they're, they're, they're from a French family, right? They, 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 uh, they were born, I believe Peter Navarre was born in Detroit and then uh, came down uh, to, to Toledo, like the Presqu'il area on, uh, on the east side. And then the Navarre brothers are from a, a proudly French family. And uh, typically in history, if you're proudly French, it means you are not a gigantic fan of the English. So the Navarre brothers really dislike the English and side immediately with the American forces. Said, whatever we can do for you, we'll do, we'll do for you. So the Navarres become scouts. Um, these brothers know the uh, forests and swamps of Southeast Michigan, Northwest Ohio, like in the back of their hand. Um, the Navars had, as as we read from histories, uh, they are said to have had really good relationships with the native nations around here, um, and that Peter Navarre was capable of speaking a whole bunch of different uh, native languages. So the Navarre brothers are helping the American army by scouting ahead, warning them of what they see, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
So the Navars are working out ahead of the American army uh, that is heading towards what is today Monroe, Michigan, what was back then called Frenchtown. And the Navarre brothers report back to the uh, Allied commander, the American commander. Um, uh, look, uh, there's a bunch of British soldiers up there and native warriors, and we think this is going to go really bad for you. And he's like, silly man, I don't need to listen to you. And he walks his guys into this uh, trap, uh, which becomes known alternately as the Battle of Frenchtown or the Frenchtown Massacre, uh, where this American force is essentially wiped out by a uh, British and native allied force. The Navarre brothers survive that. Now, they, they survive it. There's, their survival story is pretty incredible because the Navarre brothers had been caught by the British and they were parole. And when, uh, when you're on military parole, you have to promise you're not going to go back to the other side again. Um, these guys made the promise not to go back to the other side, but they did. So if they had been caught, they could have been executed. Well, they managed to avoid the hangman's noose. They managed to uh, survive that massacre at Monroe. And this happens in, I believe, January of 1813. They retreat back towards what will become Toledo, back towards the Maumee River, where they know there's an American army uh, starting to prepare to defend this part of the world. And what they come back to uh, is the beginning of the construction of a massive fortification near Perrysburg, Ohio. Now, it wasn't called Perrysburg back then. This fort, Fort Meggs, is going to be built on the site of a place that had been called Orleans of the North. Um, and Orleans of the North was a really small settlement that was started by, uh, I believe it was the guy who had helped survey Cleveland, Ohio, and maybe even helped name, name Cleveland, Ohio. Um, that guy had come this way and starts this small settlement called Orleans of the North, and William Henry Harrison builds his fortification at, at Orleans. Um, and we know it today as Fort Meggs, which you saw in the intro to this video. Um, Fort Meggs becomes this massive, really important encampment. This is the edge of American-controlled territory. Like, when you are standing at Fort Meigs in, Par in today's Parisburg, and you look across to Maumee, you are looking across what was at that point an international border. You are looking over at British-controlled territory. And I think that's kind of fascinating to think about, that you're looking over a, uh, a border there. So Harrison commands these uh, American Army forces in northwest Ohio. He starts building Fort Meigs, um, both as a... Uh, defensive position to keep the British from coming in, and it can support, it's kind of like a, a forward operating base today, it can support missions that go out to attack uh, British and native allied forces. So it, it serves both an offensive and a defensive purpose. The British realize this, and the British have that old fort that we talked about before, Fort Miamis, which is located in Maumee on the other side of the river, on River Road going towards Toledo just before you get to the turnpike, um, there's this park called Fort Miamis Park, and that's a British fort. So the, the British are using the remains of that old Fort Miamis from way back in the, the Battle of Fallen Timbers. They're uh, kind of redoubling down on that and using that as their forward operating base to attack Fort Meigs. And what the British and natives decide to do is a siege. The Americans don't have any other posts around. They believe if they get enough forces around this Fort Meigs, they can starve the place out. Well, they start that in the spring. Um, by the summer, they kind of back off of it. They had, they had tried really hard to starve out and break the siege. It doesn't happen. Um, after that fails, the British and Native Alliance kind of melts away into the forest, and they head uh, down towards something that was called Fort... Uh, oh boy, now I'm going to mess it up. Was it Fort Krogan or Fort Stevenson? I, I can't recall which, but it, it was where uh, today's Fremont is. So they fall back to there. They try to lay siege to that fort. That siege also fails, and that was a pretty dramatic uh, siege. Like, like the British Native Alliance gets right up to the walls of that place and everything. Um, all of this fighting over the summer is a lead-up to one of the great battles in American history. Um, while the fighting is happening in northwest Ohio... Way over in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, if you drive about an hour and a half past Cleveland along the lake, in Erie, Pennsylvania, a guy named Oliver Hazard Perry, you may note his name around Northwest Ohio quite a bit, um, Perry is putting together a fleet of ships. He's having ships built in a hurry, um, small warships to go out and fight the British Great Lakes fleet. Um, Perry's uh, small kind of rough ships get launched in August 
Uh, he takes them out. They get them fit out. They train the crews because they had some some crew crewmen who had never been on a boat before who are now uh, being asked to fight a ship in war. Um, these guys head out on the lake in August. Uh, they start making their way for the middle of Lake Erie. Uh, and they are at today's Putin Bay, the party island, South Bass Island. Um, they're out there and they sight the British fleet coming. And the British have decided they're going to commit their Great Lakes fleet to destroying this Lake Erie fleet uh, under Oliver Hazard Perry. Um, Perry and his small fleet very skillfully um, end up engaging the British fleet. Uh, it's it's really a textbook maneuver of the old you know days of yore sailing where you get the weather gauge and when you've got advantage of the weather you ride the wind, you, uh, you do what's called crossing the T, you uh, Perry ends up losing one of his ships, uh, one of his very important ships, transfers his flag to another ship, uh, leads the attack from there, and then sends a, well, first of all, you're probably really familiar with the flag that he flew, a blue flag that in white letters said, don't give up the ship. Uh, and then he sends a message back to William Henry Harrison that says, we have met the enemy and they are ours. The Americans win that battle decisively, completely. And with that, the British threat on the Great Lakes is gone. Now, at least on the water. Now, what does that mean? It means William Henry Harrison no longer has to keep his big force at Fort Meigs. He can take that big force, march up toward Monroe, march up toward Detroit, and attack into Canada. Harrison's going to march his men into Canada. They're going to defeat the British Native Alliance in a battle called the Battle of the Thames near today's Chatham-Kent, Ontario. Um, if you ever go to Chatham-Kent, let me know. I have a, uh, a recommendation for a poutine restaurant there. And if you don't know what poutine is, you really need to look it up. It is a heart attack on a plate, and it is absolutely delicious. And I have never had better poutine than I've had at Crave's Poutine Shack in Chatham-Kent, near, near where the Battle of the Thames was. So what? Why do we care about this? Well, we care about it because of this. Tecumseh is killed at the Battle of the Thames. And with Tecumseh's death and the collapse of Tecumseh's native confederation that was supporting the British, this is the end of native and settler fights in uh, the Ohio Territory. No longer are there going to be native raids on white settlements. Um, and no longer are there going to be white raids into Indian Territory. This is, this is the end of the native presence in the Ohio Territory. Now... When I was a kid, the way we were kind of taught this history is that's when everything went right. And that's why we were able to get here. And, and it was kind of a rah-rah. Yeah, we, we beat them. And they didn't call them Native Americans back then. We beat the Indians and uh, made this place safe. I would really uh, encourage you to think about the opposite reaction of that if you were an Ottawa member. And there are lots of Ottawa who still live uh, uh, primarily in Oklahoma. They have a reservation in Oklahoma, but there are Ottawa people who live throughout Northwest Ohio and Northeast Indiana, uh, Southeast Michigan. Think about this from the Ottawa perspective. Remember that the Ottawa, if we go back to the 1600s, they're living a peaceful existence in mid-Michigan. Then you have uh, Pontiac's conspiracy, and that goes pretty badly for them after the French and Indian War. The Ottawa are forced to move south, they move into the Maumee Valley. They finally establish what they hope will be a peaceful homeland again. Then you have the Battle of Fallen Timbers because of American encroachment. And remember, Americans had signed a treaty saying that land is yours, but we, we welched on the treaty. Then you have the Battle of Fallen Timbers. Then there's another treaty that says, yes, 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 you get to keep the Maumee Valley. Now there's another war. And now there's going to be more treaties. And now this land that was yours is no longer yours. Um, and one of the things that we keep trying to talk about in this class is the idea of place. Toledo is an important place to me. Toledo is an important place, I hope, to you. And if it's not already an important place to you, I hope by the end of this class, Toledo will be an important place to you. Land isn't as important as family, but land is the context for our family a lot of times. And you will hear people who go back to wherever it is their families came from. You'll hear stories of African-American people going back to uh, West Africa and standing at the place 
where the slave markets were and feeling this incredible personal surge of emotions because you know this my people came through here my family came through here um i personally kind of felt that uh when i went to france a few years ago uh part of my family is from france and i felt an enormous sense of place um whenever i go back to the small town in pennsylvania where my grandpa was born i feel that sense of place that this was this was our place for the ottawa to this day this was their place and it isn't anymore it was it was taken from them so i really encourage you to look at this from their perspective this is the end of an era for the ottawa and, and the miami now it is also the beginning of an era okay and so while we can mourn the end of one era we also need to recognize the beginning of this new era um this opens northwest ohio to american settlers from the east and those american settlers are going to flood in it's going to be a trickle in 1812 by 1817 it's going to be a flood by 1850 um it's just amazing how fast northwest ohio is going to fill up with people uh, from the east so i really encourage you to look at this from both directions um this is the end of one story of toledo and it's the beginning of another story of toledo so we'll talk about that beginning in our next video thanks for watching you guys and as always be well